All right, hi everyone and welcome. I'm Sharon Murray, the Investor Engagement Manager at the Good Food Institute. For those of you not yet familiar with my organization, GFI is an international nonprofit that is reimagining meat production. We work across the areas of policy, science and technology, and corporate engagement to build a more sustainable, secure, and just protein supply. So we're here today with a wonderful set of panelists to discuss how we're gonna feed a growing global population that's expected to reach 10 billion people by 2050. Alongside the people on the planet's growth, there's expected to be a 70% increase of demand for food and particularly protein. And so that brings us to the question of how are we gonna feed this growing global population? And unfortunately, our current food production system is just not a viable option. As hopefully everybody here knows by now after a week at COP, the food system contributes to over one third of global greenhouse gas emissions. And protein production through animals by itself contributes 20% of greenhouse gas emissions. In addition, animal protein production uses 77% of agricultural land, but only produces one third of our protein supply. And so if we try to scale our production system using current methods only, we're gonna need multiple planets. So if anybody's aware of habitable planets, anywhere that we can use, you know, please, please speak up. But barring that, we're going to need to shift our protein production system. And so what is the solution? Luckily, we have three excellent solutions in the place of alternative proteins. So this includes plant-based protein. This is everything from something that's been around for centuries, like tofu, to new methodologies that are trying to truly biomimic meat, eggs, and dairy, like the Impossible Burger. We also have fermentation technology to leverage and sell cultivated meat to be able to feed this growing population, close that protein gap, and meet our climate goals. So today, we're gonna talk about how innovators in the space, both startups and corporates, are moving the system forward. So I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists here, and we're just gonna go down the line and have them introduce themselves and speak about how their work relates to alternative proteins. So Renat, let's start with you. Hello, can you hear well? Good. I'm Renata Ñanos, I'm from Barcelona, and six years ago, almost six years ago, I founded together with Mark, another activist, a plant-based meat company. And we've done it because we thought that it was the best tool to change the food system. We, have, we were working in the consciousness activism and social activism, and we've seen that there were a lot of information available, people were getting conscious, however, there were no good options in the market yet. And what we do, it's when we, when we think about the product, we don't think about doing alternatives, because doing alternatives limit yourself when to success animal meat, because we can, because we use technology from this century, not technology from last centuries. And we, we exist to create products, but also to put consciousness in the market, because what we need is people understanding which is the impact of the things we put on our plates. Once we deliver this, once this information is democratic, change will be more available. Lately, I'm listening a lot on now the priority should be recession, it should be the undemocratic regimes going rise, it should be um, political instability. However, what we want to make sure, and we have to make sure as an industry, it's to to put planet first. There is no recession to solve. There is not political instability to, to fight for. There is no democ democracy to fight for if we don't put the planet first. And I think this is what this COP27, apart from few spaces, it's lacking. We need to put the food system at the very, 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 very center. If we're not putting it, this doesn't make sense. And for me, the objective here is to make sure that this COP is the beginning of the end of all COPs. We are not touring around the world to be a eco-friendly Coachella. We have to make sure that we close. I, I don't want to reach at 150 COP. I want to make sure that in the next five years we make the steps so we can stop and we can go to Coachella to dance. And we don't have to come here to talk about the small steps. We have to make sure that we put the big steps on the table and the food system is for sure at the top three of those steps. Yeah, and I'm Monk and I work in uh, Alpha Level. Uh, and I'm, uh, I'm heading up the uh, sustainability team in the food and water division. And we work a lot with 
heat transfer, cooling and heating of uh, products, separation, brain or mechanical separation, um, and also fluid handling. Uh, and and so we are a technology provider into this industry, and and for us, it's really key to be a part of this transition. Uh, and my name is Charles Brand. I head up Tetra Pak's uh, integrated industrial food solutions business. Uh, we're often known for the ubiquitous package, but we deliver equipment uh, for ice cream, cheese, alimentary powders, and uh, liquid food applications. Um, alternative proteins have, have been a part of our business for decades now, uh, with soya and, and oats, for instance, in the early days. Uh, now we've got new generations of products coming out with things like hemp seed products, uh, insect protein, uh, pea proteins. And of course, the big frontier now is the frontier of fermentation, both precision and biomass. And here we see, uh, and very exciting to have uh, young startup companies uh, working alongside uh, us as industrial companies, really pushing that, fr that f new frontier of new products going out into the market to feed this growing population. Hi, Hi everyone. So my name is Feng Ru, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Turtle Tree. We cannot continue feeding the world with the same amount of water that we're using, the same amount of land that we're using. We need to start innovating to think about how we can feed the next 2 billion people, 2 billion by 2050. We need to think about vertical farming, we need to think about alternative proteins, novel methods of producing food, and this is where Turtle Tree come in. We are a biotech company focused on building facilities and, and processes to produce milk and milk proteins without the animal. So we think about accessibility. When it comes to milk, I come from Singapore. We have no access to fresh milk. So if we're able to build food systems close to big cities, we can dramatically lower the impact of logistics. We can dramatically increase the impact of every food that we try to produce within each food system. So in Turtle Tree, we are based in Singapore, Boston, and California. And uh, we're, we're looking on a B2B2C model, partnering up with the major food companies to launch food products on the market. Wonderful, thank you all. And I love just the variety of approaches we have here, right? Up and down the value chain, from plant-based to fermentation. No cell cultivated here today, but perhaps Turtle Tree will, will get us there soon as well. So, as discussed, right, we need to close this protein production gap, and that means we need to scale up the volume of production. So my question to the panelists here is, how are we going to produce the volumes of protein we need? But as Ben Gru said, while limiting the use of land, the use of water, the use of chemicals, energy, and really build a sustainable production system. Maybe I can start here. Of course, we need to focus on, on a lot of new uh, products, uh, but we also need to focus on the existing. So get more out of what we already do today. So one example is um, we've been working with an olive oil producer in Spain um, that has a waste stream called wet husk, where you have the stones and the skin and the pulp uh, and a lot of water and, uh, and also oil. There's a lot of olive oil going into there. And in order to get that out uh, in an efficient way, uh, we have worked with them and, uh, and found a way how to separate, uh, separate a lot of the water out and a lot of the oil out before you go into the chemical extraction process, which is already happening. So really um, upcycling waste stream and reducing the environmental footprint. And this olive oil uh, producer is now collecting waste streams from 40 olive oil mills in the region. So it's, it's key to focus on the new, but also to continue optimizing the existing. Can, can yeah, I, I ask a quick that. question to you? Let's make it conversational. So in, in your process, how do you measure the sustainability of it um, as, as a lead of sustainability? What is the KPIs that you guys help your customers achieve? It, it's actually a lot about generating more out of less. So uh, increasing the yield, if you can increase the yield, uh, create more food, uh, then you also have a sustainable business case because that is what is needed to drive this transition. Um, so, so taking the waste stream and uh, upcycle it 
um, then, then you have the KPIs. I love it. You're probably asking your customers, would you put money on the table? And they would say no. <laughs> no, actually, I think uh, when people, we have seen cases where people, when they see, okay, if I do this differently and I get a stream out, I had a customer buying within five days, he bought 10 big machines wow. because he could see that value stream yeah. can generate profit to me. So, so having uh, these cases and it's about showing them. That, that's very powerful. I mean, being, being a large-scale industrial company supplying into the food industry, we obviously have to set goals for ourselves. So we have a 2030 goal to reduce our customer operations by 50% in CO2, water usage, and food loss. So one way for us is to set bold goals and, and then to take action. Um, if I just describe a couple of areas of action, because one of them is in, in not in precision fermentation, but biomass fermentation, where we're taking all of our knowledge to bear to work with a company called Mikarena in, in Sweden that does fungi biomass uh, fermentation. And there we're building a large scale plant for that type of food product uh, for them. Another good example in, in a more kind of existing type of product is with Oatly, where we're introducing a chemical recovery for the cleaning chemicals, chemical recovery system, and a water recycling system. So the chemical recovery takes 80% of the chemicals out, and the water recovery recovers 240,000 liters a day at full uh, capacity. So these things become business propositions for those large companies. And, and today it's interesting because sustainability and return on investment are not in conflict with each other. They actually are working together with each other. Yeah, yeah that's excellent. And, and I'll let you go in one moment. But just to say, right, not just producing these new proteins, but really thinking about side stream valorization, circular economy, that is critical both in, in helping scale and make this affordable, which, which we'll get to in a moment, but also to, when we're building a new food system, let's build a new food system, right? Let's think about all aspects of it. Please, we're not. Cool. I mean, everything they point, it, it makes a lot of sense, but the answer is very clear. I mean, we have to push a protein transition. There is no other. And plant-based is already here. We don't have to create something more. We just have to push what we already have. And then getting better and better and better. But the University of Oxford points out that your carbon footprint can be reduced by 70% just by ditching animal meat and dairy. If we have these numbers, and then we see here at COP beef being served, chicken being served, fish being served, it, it feels like a dystopian world, being in a climate emergency summit and then not pushing what the data from the United Nations says. It's not the data just from one other source, it's from the source that is organizing this. And this is very important. And many people say, how it can it be that 73%? It's because the numbers are huge. And we don't have availability to those numbers. We have seven, more than 70 billion farm animals every year killed to serve our plates. And this is a lot. And if we put the marine animals, which normally they're left apart, it's 70 hundred billion more, which is already almost 800 billion animals every year. And this is not sustainable at all. And for example, um, let me look at the numbers because it's 80% of the, of the farming land goes to feed these animals and 60% of the emissions of every year of the food system comes from animal farming. When we know all this, it doesn't make any sense, but I can go even further. It's just 18% of the calories every year comes from animals, 18%, which I think this summarizes as an inefficiency. However, I can add more. It's 35% of the proteins every year comes from animals. And I said all the, numbers, uh, all the numbers before. When we have all this in a database, we, we have a clear answer to your question, which is we have to push a protein transition. And we have to push a protein transition that does not leave anyone behind. And this is on our hands. If we wait more, we will leave people behind. And we, we have to work NGOs, we have to work companies, we have to work the public sector, institutions, everyone, to make sure that we transition step by step 
I'm a vegan and I would love tomorrow to have a vegan world. It's not possible. I want to make sure that we transition, so we make sure that there is a greener economy, and I totally agree, profit can be a synonym of, of a green transition, and it has to be. We have to push that, but we have to push it now. I agree. Hi, I, I totally agree. I'll quote Paul Pullman. You can do a lot of good, but earn a lot of money at the same time. So I think the transition is the key thing. There is still a lot of benefits, health benefits to animal-based protein, but we got to think about more creative ways of producing the same protein. So the way that Turtle Tree is looking at it, we're looking at these high-value immunity-boosting proteins that are found in cow milk and human milk. So our first protein that we're targeting is called lactoferrin. All of our customers are looking for it. Tetra Pak does a lot of research around the next trend that is coming along. And with COVID these days, a lot of the focus is on immunity boosting. It's about gut health. It's about the gut-brain axis. So for us, we are able to produce this gut-boosting proteins using this process called precision fermentation. So we're able to get microbes, so they could be yeast or fungi, to take in sugar and pump out animal protein, just like how an animal would, but without going through the animal. And this whole process, we do have side streams as well that we can valorize into complex sugars or oligosaccharides that can be continued to put into the food. And I was just on a panel um, with other startups just now, and there was a company using black soldiers' flies as animal feed. So they need nutrients for these flies, so these flies can be nutrients for animals, so the animals can be more efficient in their milk generation, in protein generation, and so on. I think it needs to be a transition. Plant-based is important. There's no way people are going to move over to plant-based overnight, but having different sources of food is what is key. Yeah, we, we very much believe in, in that, uh, that complementary nature of the, two, of the two sources. There's no question to feed 10 or 11 billion uh, people. We're going to need to transition to another kind of protein. Um, there is just a huge amount of investment. And in fact, I saw in one of your reports, 12 billion has gone into uh, plant-based proteins since 2010, and 75% of that in just the last couple of years. So the the level of investment is going up hugely. Um, we're putting a lot of effort in, and it, it's very exciting, and we're very happy and proud to be working with Turtle Tree. Um, and that is a bit of the nature of this, in, this industry now, is that it's, it's not scalable very quickly. Development has got to go in. I mean, the, just the word precision fermentation gives you a little bit of an idea that there's a lot of things that have, even though the industrial process may be the same, there are a lot of things that have got to come together to make the product not just on pilot scale, but on uh, full industrial scale. And so working together with startups and academia and using the the kind of standard tried and tested processes that we have for going from a development project into a pilot scale, into small scale industrial and full scale, that is the way to safely and properly take it into, that, uh, into the consumer's hands. Yeah, so let me take two of the topics that were just discussed and we'll, we'll go there next so we can expand on them. And just one quick point actually before that. So to Charles' point, yes, it's been great to see an acceleration in investment into alternative proteins. Through the third quarter of this year, we're at $13.3 billion invested across the three production technologies. But over the same time, we have had $2.4 trillion invested in climate solutions overall. So $13 billion is great, but... You know, it's all relative, and that's maybe, what, 0.05% while we're talking about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions, 75% of land. So we need to keep that in mind. Okay, the two points I'd love to double-click on, if we can, here. So to Fengru, on the nutrition side. So we need to produce the protein, right? We need to feed people. But we also have to make sure that it's nutritious. And as Bernat highlighted, if only about one-third of our protein is being created through animals, we know that developed markets are eating the vast majority of that. And so how do we make sure that we're providing nutritious, healthy food 
for the developed market side to reduce the risk of cancer and all of the other heart disease, all of the risks that are caused by animal meat. On the emerging market side, how do we make sure that everybody has access to equitable nutrition? So please, let's go there next. So this first protein that we're targeting, lactoferrin, give us some background about the market and the size of the lactoferrin market. So currently, 90% of lactoferrin goes into infant nutrition and only 5% of infant nutrition has lactoferrin. It has so many good benefits. It helps with your gut, it boosts your immunity. Why is it nor, more, not more accessible to the other babies out there? Why can't adults access it? It's because of the price point. Today, lactoferrin trades between $700 to $1,500 per kg. And you compare that with whey. Whey is at $2 a kg. And why is that so? There is very little lactoferrin found in milk. There is only 0.1 grams in one whole liter of milk. So you need to go through a lot of milk before you can get a little bit of that benefit that everyone is asking for. So using precision fermentation, we are able to get up to much higher yields for people to access this protein. And then we will be able to allow the B2B partners to introduce this ingredient into their food products, into their infant nutrition, and so on. So for us, it's not just about empty calories. It's not 20 grams of protein. It's not 15 grams of carbohydrates. It's functional proteins. Proteins that you don't need a lot of, but gives you the full health benefits that it was, it was meant for. And, and all these fantastic uh, solutions that is already uh, developed but are still to be pushed to, uh, to industrial scale in uh, all over the world, I would say. Uh, that's where we need to work together. That's where we need to, uh, to team up and, and dare uh, create new partnerships across the value chain. Um, and also utilizing companies like, like us uh, here, uh, having the knowledge on heat transfer separation uh, and so on, when you go to industrial scale. Uh, so we get that trans transition going fast uh, and efficient. I, 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 I think we need to think about the, the topic of speed and transformation. Um, when we're going from something that is as nascent, as early as it is today, um, it takes time to industrialize things and to do it safely and in a way that does not have unintended consequences in the long term. I think the, the exciting part of what's going, the many exciting parts of what's going on now, but one is that the pool is actually coming from the developed market today. It's healthy living, it's a more sustainable diet, it's in more interesting products, it's whether, you know, if you don't, vegetarianism and veganism. What that is doing is it's creating a platform of development. Uh, it's creating technologies, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, although the industrial process may be relatively similar, the, the precision, uh, the formulation, the specific nature of each of the processes to produce that very specific lactoferrin or HMO or egg albumin or whatever type of protein it is, that is very specific to that installation. We need that time to create the truly high-scale industrial solutions. Those are the ones then that are going to help to um, to transfer into the emerging populations and provide a better, a better platform of nutrition for the long term. For me, there is another point, uh, which is key, it's that we don't have to take animal meat as a benchmark. I think we take too much the benchmark of nutrition of animal meat and we can do much better. This is very limited, and it's very limited because it goes through an animal. And an animal is a technology that you can change a bit, but you cannot change a lot. However, if we use technology from this century, the benchmark should be being much better. Plus, there is something that still we have to explore a lot, which is the plant-based kingdom. It's huge. And we still use mainly soy and pea. But there are many other sources to explore. And if we put all the budget, all the investment that it's going to try to make more sustainable one industry that it's clear, and I said all the numbers before, that it's obsolete, if we put this, this budget into trying to accelerate this because there is no more time, um, I think we will reach better nutrition, same taste at least, if not better, 
and easiness to cook, everything that the animal meat has, the positive side of animal meat, but with all the positive side of plant-based. And, and this is possible. We just need some time. I, I would like disagree a bit, like because I, I feel there is like the number says that we have to accelerate this a lot. Obviously, we have to make it sure that it's in a safety manner, but it's possible. I mean, Eura, we started Eura with 40k in, in Barcelona, two guys asking family and friends, and now we are selling in many countries and we are showing that plan B is possible. This is made by two guys with very few resources. Imagine if all the money goes, goes to that, not to Eura, but to the consumers to have accessibility. Yeah. Two guys with not a lot of resources, but clearly a lot of energy, <laughs> at least if, if this half here is indicative. And I love the point that you made about the plant protein sources themselves, because you're right, we've used, mostly used commodity crops, because that's what's been available, especially for startups. But there's so many exciting other crops to explore, and they can help with helping small-scale farmers, right? We can use indigenous crops that help biodiversity, that uh, regenerate the land and also are more nutritious. Uh, we can use things like algae, which has omega-3s, right? Fish don't produce that themselves. They get that from the algae that they consume and then they are also unfortunately consuming mercury and microplastics and a lot of things we don't want. And so let's explore those proteins. So it's a very good point. Thank you, please. I think there is um, a way to partner in every level. So from our point of view, on the research side, we do have a lot of partnerships with research institutes, with universities, even with plant-based options. Say your Oatly or your plant-based milks, these are great products, but when it comes to having functional benefits, we are partnering up with some of the biggest plant-based milk companies to introduce our ingredients into their plant-based milk products to make it a fortified plant-based milk. So that is an angle. And Think about it, lactoferrin in the past was from animal milk, right, from cow milk. You couldn't put lactoferrin into plant-based milk because then it wouldn't be plant-based. But now with precision fermentation, there's a whole new market that we can expand together. And I think this is a great opportunity. Now on the industrialization level, it's really these guys who have the, they have the experience and they, they have the know-how to be able to scale to feed the world. I've been to some of the largest plants in the world. These are $800 million plants, and it's not something that startups like us can do on our own. I mean, even every equipment, every piece of technology, every piece of engineering that goes into the separation technology, that goes into the centrifugation technology, there is so much engineering involved, and it's really partnering up with these folks introducing new technology to, to produce food for the world. We, we are feeding the world here, and skill is the name of the game. Yeah, so let's, let's spend a little bit more time here. This topic has been coming up over and over. Charles, in particular, has been highlighting it, that we need to scale these technologies. And that's challenging, both from an engineering perspective, right? It's not the same producing something at lab scale than at commercial scale. And certainly, from a dollar perspective, that $13 billion is not going to scale alternative proteins to the size that we need it to be. So how can companies work together? And again, our panelists have already been touching upon this. But let's just spend a little more time here, because it's a really big question. I, I, before, before I, I'll, touch, I'll answer your question, but I just wanted to, to address uh, your point. I am a big believer in the complementary nature of lots of different initiatives. I don't think one is going to solve everything. Uh, animals are going to be uh, a source of protein for many, many years to come, if not forever. And other types of plant-based initiatives, I think, will have a life together. So I think, I think that, that's something I truly, I truly believe in. Um, coming back to your, to your, to your question, that um, wh the way of working between the different part uh, partners in the value chain, so the, the startups, academia, our, our process of taking a customer, which is not new for the fermentation area, but which is something we've had, had for many years. We've got 12 uh, product development centers that we use for our customers to come in, trial, some, trial a product, formulate it, turn it into something that is then commercially viable, test market it, and get it going. Because just because you have a product doesn't mean that consumers are actually going to buy it. I usually say test, 
taste, texture, price. Those three things have got to work with the consumer, whatever the product is. And, and that just says that there is a period of time that it takes to get it right. And, uh, and that we have to do in partnership between all of the, the parts of the value chain to make it work properly. And, and just building on that, uh, having, the, having the challenges uh, in front of us also drives the innovation much more. So if we have a specific case where we need to treat something or convert something or twist something, that's really something we love as a technology provider to help making that possible. Uh, maybe it wasn't possible yesterday, but really seeing the greater purpose of uh, doing that innovation. Um, and we have a lot of R&D hubs uh, where we can drive this innovation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, an invention is not an innovation. It's only an innovation if you're able to commercialize it. So I think that's where the experience of the large companies really come in. And I, I like to like quote my experience with Tetra Pak. They, how they work with startups is showing us how they work with their customers. So we, we have a very close relationship with them. And they have this experience center in their regional HQs where they introduce ingredient providers, ingredient um, innovators like us to go through what their customers would go through, understanding what are the trends for the consumers on the market, understanding the different processes and support that Tetra Pak can give their customers. And that's how we see what's important to them. And that's how we can partner up with them. Why not? <laughs> um, for me, in the, in the point of scale, sorry, I'm a bit more like, I take risks eh? <laughs> in general in life. But in the point of scaling, I think, and I, and I say this because there, there are counters here saying how many years we have to give a solution. And it says that it, it's six years. So, I mean, we can say that we can take and we can do a transition that's very slow, but rather the, the data says that we don't have this time. So just in the European Union, 30 billion euros go every year to try to make animal meat and dairy cheap. And this is the reality. This is the reality. So institutions here, and obviously, like, I mean, companies, we have to work together to make sure that the institutions put the money in the right place. And I'm not saying that it has to go to us to put my salary up. No, 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 no. It has to go to, to, the, to the consumer. The consumer has to have at least price parity as soon as possible. Because yes, price, it's a, it's a big point. But we will reach price if the subsidies stop going to an, to an industry that has negative impact and start going to industries that have positive impact. And like, it, it doesn't make sense that the European Union, I mean, is doing many things right. But we talk a lot about the 2030 agenda. There is no 2030 agenda if we stop giving subsidies to the industry that pollutes more our continent. It, it doesn't make sense. So scaling quicker than what it has been used in the past, it's possible. We just have to make sure that we push the institutions and then the investment side, the private investment side, to the, to the path of the positive, of the positive impact. And yes, I, I totally agree with you. Eh? We are more close than, <laughs> than, than what we, we think. But um, Maybe one thing, because I, I, I agree with you, the, the meat um, food chain will, will stay there for a long time uh, still, uh, if we want. But I think there will be a demand for it. Uh, also, we need to increase the amount of food uh, in the world. Um, so. So here it's also about optimizing and make sure we get more out of less. Uh, and, and we have a case where we have increased the output by 15% by working uh, together. Um, and I think that's also important to continue doing that while also investing heavily. There should also be money, uh, a lot of money spent into uh, But we should not forget about the existing and continue optimizing all streams. So we've got about five minutes left here. I have plenty more to ask these fantastic panelists, but would love to first open it up to the audience. Anybody have any questions to pose? Yeah, we got a couple here. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm Kanchan Lama. 
I am uh, from Nepal, but now you see I am doing some party overflow for Canada. Okay, and when you were, you know, I was standing there, I was trying to articulate uh, what is the impo important, very interesting topic. Because if you relate to climate change in my country, Nepal, developing country, uh, our women, especially pregnant mo mothers and pregnant women, they are they suffer most due to you know lack of protein fluid. So like they get anemic and they get malnourished. Big huge problem. All the UN organizations and all the developing uh, development organizations are funding many programs, but there is no sustainable way how to enable them to produce in their own land, you know, some kind of this plant breed, you know, plant uh, based protein. But on the other end, in all, all those parts, our forefathers, you know, our grandparents always lived with plant protein. Hey? It, is, it was not new anything. Myself, me, I am 75. I use, I use plant protein. So I, I know the value, but how can we enable that kind of you know, intervention in those areas where most deprived, poor people can really make it? Because it will be real fantastic and sustainable. As you said, yes, we will have to do it the existing months. We cannot forget. But how can the transition be, be with investment, we, you know, actually efforts, how can we make it happen? It will be a wonderful dream. Thank you. Maybe I can um, maybe I can start first by addressing the anemic um, challenges around women. So the the first protein that we're targeting is called lactoferrin. From the word ferrin, it helps with iron regulation. So it helps to transport iron throughout the body, which means it helps with anemic mothers. It helps with um, more oxygen into your brain and better muscle recovery. So for us, using novel methods of producing lactoferrin, we can make it accessible at a price point that is acceptable for consumers in other markets outside of that 5% of infant nutrition, which has lactoferrin today. We're going to drive the cost down so everyone can have access to it. One comment from my side is, uh, oh, now it comes in here, is um, that we have this innovation house in Serbo where we have a lot of startup, uh, more than 20 startup uh, companies working. And there's actually one company that has been focusing on reducing waste at the very start of the food chain. So having a way of preserving uh, the food coming out, agriculture or um, yeah, whatever uh, food there is produced, so it so it's it, it's not wasted, but preserved and can be safe for a longer time. Um, and I think um, thinking together, uh, teaming up uh, with startups and other companies to try to uh, optimize the reduction of waste in the early stage of the food production, I think there we can do much more. Thank you. And I think maybe very quickly we can take one more question there. Thank you so much, panelists. I'm Christine. I work at the Life Institute on improving fish welfare for capture fisheries and aquaculture. So Bernard brought up a really critical point that seafood is a very neglected area. Um, of you know protein, alternative protein. So how do we get more investment in this area? And how do we influence industry to provide more plant-based food at conferences like the UN? And also for UN to stop using aquatic foods as the next, as the solution to livestock. Maybe, um, maybe, maybe I, I'm, I'm going to give an answer which I, uh, covers both the two here and also uh, the point here, because although uh, businesses, we come up with innovations, we come up with solutions to problems and we provide them. So if there is a way to use seafood protein, uh, which there obviously is, then it's our role to look, search that out. But I think policymakers have a role to play and they have got to understand the country situation and say this is unacceptable. They've got to say it's unacceptable to subsidize 
the animal industry in this way because it is not promoting the right behavior and I think this is where we have to look to to the policymakers to support those transitions um, I'm gonna try first to to answer your question I don't remember your name sorry I don't hear, but anyway, uh, I'm a big fan of Nepal, my favorite country in the world. And when, for me, one of the things that we lack in this, in this industry, it's how we unlock the, the democratic making of our products. It, it shouldn't just be for an elite that can pay five euros for a package. Our objective should be, if we really are mission driven, to unlock this. And when we unlock this, these products will, will be in Nepal, will be in Africa, will be in, me, in, in every corner of the world because without tokens there is no freedom. And this is the most important thing because we say, hey, yes, Europe is growing in plant-based. Yes, because Europe has accessibility to plant-based. And this is very key. And so for, for me and for the whole organization, one of our objectives is to be in every corner. Obviously, this needs uh, sustainable growth because now we cannot go everywhere but the objective of the UN should be also like to push this not just for Europe and for North America and Japan but for all the world and regarding fish I think there are two things that I think that would change the the whole food system but also the marine lives and one it's obviously using these subsidies but I say it again, I don't use it for the, for the companies, but to make sure that the consumers uh, have more accessibility, plus uh, helping all the people behind the fishing industry and the animal industry to do steps, because there are very interesting reports these weeks of saying that many farmers, for example, in the UK, want to make a transition, but they don't know how. They need the how, and they need the resources. And if we put the resources and the how on the table, this will happen and this will start to happen. Things that change in many, many decades will change now faster because we need it. And the other one, and I think this is very key, and I think here the policymakers can help a lot, it's people have to have accessibility to not just the nutrients a product has, but the impact the product has. Because if you don't have anything to hide in your production, in your supply chain, you have to be able to say which is the CO2 you use, which is the amount of water, which is the amount of resources. And we need to empower people, we need to empower consumers to ease this information that sometimes stay at COP and the elites and the universities. It has to go to every single street, square. People have to know that there are products, that a, a beef burger needs almost 2,000 liters of water. This is not just unsustainable, it's, al it's also not fair. There are people with no access to food. And this is sometimes something that we don't talk a lot. We say, in 2050, we will be this amount of people. But today, in the today food system, we are not feeding everyone. We are not feeding everyone. And this is a reality today. If we don't change quick and the growing population is happening, we'll be worse. So we have to accelerate this. Yeah, and, and we should make the transition uh, based on, uh, on data. And, and I can tell you, and we have talked about that, that uh, we have a responsibility also on making transparency on all the data on, uh, in the whole value chain. So it's really important that everyone is pushing for that transparency. All right, I think yeah, we're going to get... Oh, sorry. No, and, you, and something very important is to use one language, one single language. And this can be an agreement here at the, at the COP. We are many countries around the world can agree on using one single language and on pushing all the companies, also us, to do better. And on that note, so completely agree with all of these points. We clearly could all talk about this all day. So please do come talk to us after the session. Um, I could not agree more on the point of information flow. Everything GFI does is open access. So if you're interested in learning more about these solutions, more about the data, we have all of that available. We also recently published an ESG, Environmental Social Governance Reporting Framework, specific to alternative proteins to measure the exact impacts and make that data accessible. So look, there's clearly a lot to do, a long way to go, but all I can say is 
you know, instead of focusing on that, I'm going to focus on the clearly passionate, um, innovative panelists that we have here. And there are so many more across the industry that are driving these change. So let's end on a positive note, and then we can keep having the debate as the days and years go on. Thank you.